This is the story of Rick Ann Keel. From pitching phenom to briefly out of the game of baseball, then the remarkable return as a power hitting outfielder. A fan favorite. This is the story of redemption in the game of baseball and in the game of life. This is the story of Rick Ann Keel. All right, you're playing baseball, you're a little kid. Did you ever think in your lifetime, in your wildest imagination, you become Rick Ann Keel, New York Times bestseller with a book? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> was it fun to do the book? It was. Um, and, you know, I chose Tim Brown, and he knew the story beforehand, right? So we didn't have to start from scratch, and I think that made it easier. Um, but it was, you know, I purposely um, avoided a lot of those memories, especially when it came to the throwing stuff and even some of the childhood stuff. Um, I just never really went back and revisited it. And, and the longer you stay away from it, you do sort of forget. It becomes a different life. Um, it was interesting to go back through those times um, and then hear other people's perspectives of it also, right? What their take was on it um, and just re relive some of it. And it was good. It was very therapeutic. I didn't think, um, I thought that I had spoke about it enough um, that I was past a lot of it or whatever. But um, like I said, very therapeutic. I'm glad I did it. Um, and the you know, the feedback I got from it was really good. I bet you got it from people not in sports. I bet you got it from all walks of life, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you name it. I mean, all kind of professions of people saying they went through something similar, um, you know, and, and how they, they got over it or didn't get over it and, and how, you know, my book possibly helped them connect the dots and some things that they didn't realize um, had happened in their lives that was causing some things. Did you have any trepidation about doing it? Like, where they approach you and you go, I don't want to do a book. Uh, I know you a little bit. You're not <laughs> like that kind of guy, but I bet it was great. Yeah, I wasn't sure. Um, and, you know, the closest people around me that I trust the most, um, you know, just telling me, hey, listen, this is going to be a good thing. You're going to you're going to help people. Um, and then the first thing I, I wanted to do is reach out to my mom. And I said, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And I want to make sure that you're OK with it first, because, you know, you're going to have to relive some of this stuff with me. So, um, you know, she was on board and, and I think it was beneficial for both of us. How many people have you heard from? I mean, if you could put a number on it, what do, what do you think that is? I don't even know if there's a thousands. Number. Yeah, it was a lot, um, you know, especially when we were out uh, marketing the book and going through it. Um, yeah, it was, and it, you know, it felt good to, to feel that it's rewarding to feel that you're helping people. So when you're sitting down doing an interview with me and you had to market the book, which is part of the process of doing this, did you like doing all the interviews and then having to kind of relive some of these things that some of it was great, some of it not? It was fine. It became, um, you know, you, you do so many interviews and it was the same questions over and over that it became like a, a just a pitch almost. You know, mm -hmm. I felt like I could walk into the room and just say, you know what, don't even ask a question. I'm going to just go <laughs> and then when we're done if you have something. Else. Right. Yeah. Was it, did, did any of it get uncomfortable for you in reliving some of these things? Um, from time to time, but um, like I said, it became therapeutic to just get it out there and, and um, you know, it's, I think it, at the end too, it helped a lot of my relationships. And I'll even say with you or with Tony La Russa or, or people who, where you think you know the story and you don't quite know it all and then you get in there and you get the details of it a little bit more and then I think it just helps people understand you know, where I was coming from a lot of the time. I, that's what I was gonna ask you. What was it like former teammates and people that were there in uniform, whether it was you know, coaches, Tony, players, your teammates, your buddies, what, what was their reaction to it? Um, that's a lot of the conversations that I had was, you know, I thought I knew what was going on, but really didn't know the scope of it. Um, and it just seemed to, um, it just helped. I, you know, I, I think I was, I, I got to be so standoffish from media, from everyone, just, you know, wanting to keep a lot of that stuff to myself. And, you know, a lot of the questions became about stuff I didn't want to talk about. Um, that I think it just filled in the gaps for a lot of people and it, and it just seemed to mend the relationships. Not that there was anything wrong, but just open it up and, and um, help people understand me. Could you ever figure out what happened on that day when the wildness did take place? Have you ever felt like I've gotten to the, the X factor as to why that took place? I mean, at the end of the day, you just lose your confidence. Um, in your ability, but I mean, when, when I go through it, no, there's no reason why. The more people I've talked to that have been through it, um, you know, you go through their backgrounds trying to figure out what was going to happen, but uh, 
you know, just it all spirals so fast. Um, you know, here we are. So many. We just got done with mental health, uh, mental health awareness month. Um, what would you say to somebody that in any walk of life is like on the fence about maybe going to visit somebody that could help them? What would you say? I would say go. Um, absolutely. You know, you, you, you need to talk about it. Um, you know, and you need professional, I would say you need professional help. I'm a big advocate of that. Um, and I talk all the time about Harvey Dorfman who helped me and it wasn't just the throwing stuff. It was just becoming a man and going back in and, and, you know, figuring it out that it's it's not your fault and, and ways to cope and um, healthy ways to cope and just how to get on with life. Coming up, he quits as a pitcher, but he is convinced to return as an outfielder. What was it like to return that first day back in the clubhouse? That's next on Fox 2. Scoops with Danny Mac is brought to you by Schnooks, Lou Fuse, Triad Bank, and Ryan Kelly, the home loan expert. His days of pitching were officially behind him. Now it's Rick Ann Keel, the outfielder. Could this really happen? So let's go back to your when you're sitting on the couch. Baseball's done. You were you were done, right? Mm, I was done. 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 Over. Yep. You were mentally checked out. Checked out. Said, forget <laughs> it. I'm I'm good. And they call you back, and it was literally within hours. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they say, oh, by the way, um, grab a bat. We'd like to see what you can do as a position player. When they say that to you, your response was? Um, I f well, I said, is nobody listening to me? I just I just quit. I'm done. I retired. It's over. Um, you know, back then, people just didn't let people do that. So it felt like, you know, I was kind of shocked. Um, and I needed time to think about it. Scott Boris called and said that. And I just I was like, I, I got to call you back. I gotta and, think about this. And you called him back. And you I said yes. Back. Yep, I said so yes. So what clicked? Um, I started walking around the house, and I started thinking about the process, what this was going to be like, um, you know, what the road back looked like, and that's on the field, off the field, media, everything that's going to come with it. Uh, I found a bat in the house, and I was standing in the middle of the living room, and I started taking swings, and I started visualizing um, hitting home runs, and I visualized hitting a home re run back in the big leagues, and. It was like this whole feeling came over me and picked up the phone and said, I'm in. And then you go to spring training the next day, mm -hmm. you go to the clubhouse, you show up, and what was the reaction of your teammates? Um, most people laughed. Um, I think Did that bother you? No, not really, because I felt, you know, it was the first time in a long time that I actually could joke around um, because that weight of trying to throw a strike, that worry, the constant stress uh, was gone. Um, of course, I knew I was going to have to try to play catch in the outfield, um, and I still didn't like short distances. I still don't. But, you know, when you're playing in the outfield, um, once I got out past 100 feet, I could just hit the guy in the chest for whatever no problems. Reason. No problems. So, um, you know, I just thought about it. Well, just to tell my cat throwing partner, like, start, start far. I don't want to start short. How tough was it as a hitter to come back? Was it tough? Um, yeah, it was tough. Because you're, you're an unbelievable yeah. athlete, and you did it in high school. But this is pro ball, so it's a totally different animal. But you really felt you could do it, obviously. I did. Um, and I felt like I, had, I was in a no-lose situation. Um, I knew I had power. It was going to be, could I hit for a high enough average to, to do it every day? And then, can I hit when the pitchers are now really trying to get me out? Um, which, at that point, you know, they stopped laying cookies in there for me. You know, they were starting to pitch to me. Not as much as you would a, a position player, but they weren't just throwing me cookies. So, um, you know, the biggest challenge was really getting your body ready to take that beating every single day versus versus once a week. Um, the first day, that first day I went out there, the Cardinals were great. They're like, look, take take three ABs in it, single A, take three ABs in double A, you know, blah, 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 and then meet us back over here. And I went four for six with a homer. So, um, <laughs> you know, that started out good, that's for sure. Absolutely. Uh, Jimmy Edmonds, others, our buddy, he was he was helpful. I, he's told me he gave you a glove. Okay, so yeah, well, thank you for getting back to that. So he was very helpful. So he called me over to his locker and he laughed and he's like, hey, welcome to the dark side. <laughs> um, and he gave me this little teeny glove, little infield glove. Might even be smaller than an infield glove. He's like, here, use this. Go field balls with this forever. By the time you put on your outfield glove, it'll feel like a net. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, when you're going through the minor leagues, did you think, it was it going to happen? Like, could you feel it like, hey, I'm, I'm getting there. This yeah. is going to happen. I am going to make it back. Did you feel that? Um, it took about 100 at-bats. The first 100 at-bats, um, 
you know, you're trying to figure it out, you know, and quite honestly, it was harder to hit in the lower levels um, just because guys are slinging balls all sure. over the place. They can't really throw strikes. So it, it, it took that to try to dial in the strike zone. Um, and then after that, it felt like it started to come. I felt like this is going to work. You when know? you got the call that you're getting called up, what was that like as opposed to the first call up as a pitcher and you're going to make a start in Montreal? Uh, um, it was unbelievable. I remember we were, we were in Tacoma uh, and it was Hammer Maloney and he walked in and um, our plane had been delayed. So we were supposed to fly out let's say at like 7 p.m., got delayed. We didn't end up leaving until 12 a.m. So he's like, you guys got like four hours. Go do whatever you want. Just be back at the gate whatever time. So he came and found us. We we're all sitting in a restaurant um, and gave me the news. And so, you know, immediately I start calling my wife and, um, you know, family, friends, all that. Uh, we get on the plane. I'll never forget. So we get on the plane. Now it's 12. It's 12 a.m. West Coast. So I'm flying into Memphis. I'm going to land in Memphis and then drive to St. Louis and I'm playing that night. So I sit down and I'm sitting down next to two giant people in this middle row with like zero room, <laughs> right? Um, and Chris Conroy, our trainer for the Cardinals, who's still there now, uh, he's like, hey, I got an exit row window, I'll trade you. And awesome. that might've been the greatest gift I've ever received. <laughs> so um, we traded and uh, you know, I got some sleep, I got to rest and then just an incredible, just an incredible journey. My wife was packing up the apartment in Memphis. I got there and now we're driving. You know, you would think after going through all the throwing things that I wouldn't be nervous, but, um, you know, the closer we got to the stadium, it was like, I don't know, my heart started beating. You start feeling those things. I ended up uh, missing BP. So when I got to the stadium and I walked in, um, you know, just the, the teammates and the high fives, the hugs, everybody, it was, it was incredible. Um, comparing it to the first time, it was just completely different. Um, they were both amazing just they were just way different because the second time it felt like this is redemption i made it back nobody was giving me a chance um and it was a chance for me to prove that i could do it how emotional was the drive with your wife you know i it it was it was very emotional just um in the context of what was happening and I, i'm actually thankful that we had that long flight because being tired i think just kind of Put you in like almost a, a zen type mode where i wasn't like freaking out you know yeah. um but it's you know it's it's just caring and wanting it to go well and wanting that that you know that first game to be magical and, and all the things that come with that so coming up ricky and keel makes it back to the big leagues as a hitter his first game back delivers a moment that nobody will forget that's next on scoops with danny mack scoops with danny mack is brought to you by blue tail medical group on the Run, Delta Dental, Hair Saloon for Men, and Lordo's Diamonds. And Keel out to deep right field, has a chance to leave the ballpark, it's gone! A three-run shot for Rick and Keel back in the major leagues. Remarkable. It was magical. What, what do you remember, if you can? I mean, I know you've seen it a million times. People talk about it maybe being the best moment at that ballpark. People say that they were there that night. They say, it's, I get goosebumps thinking about it now. It's the best moment they've ever seen because of everything you had gone through. What did it mean to you and, and the emotions of that night? I, it's hard to put it into words. You, um, I re so I remember my first at bats, Chris Young, you know, and he doesn't throw hard, but he throws those high fastballs. I'm left handed. I like it down, not up. Um, so I was swinging at any first pitch he threw, it was up here. I'm swinging at it. I popped it up. I think I struck out. Um, so then it, now you're 0 for 2, and it's like you can almost feel, or maybe I'm making it up. Like, well, maybe he can't do it. Maybe this isn't going to work. Um, and then I got that at bat against Doug Brocal and he you know, threw a little slider that he left kind of too far up. When I hit it, um, I wasn't sure I got enough of it, but I knew I got it pretty good. So, you know, I'm running to first, you're looking at the right fielder, you're looking at the wall, like, is it gonna go? Once I knew it was over, um, I really didn't know what to do. You know, I like gave it like a half fist pump, but I didn't go crazy. It was, what, do I do cartwheels now? You know, like <laughs> this is happening. But I remember rounding the bases and, it felt like I was in a dream. That's what it felt like. And I, I remember rounding second and I could see Cheo, Jose Akendo. And I thought, and I could, you know, the fans were going crazy. The ground was shaking. Um, and I was, I remember the thought of like, this is happening. I did it. Yes. You know? um, and it was incredible. The two throws in Colorado, the two best throws I've ever seen. Uh, 
I'll ask the guy that did it. Have you seen better throws from the outfield? Never. <laughs> that's what I like to hear. I was going to say, don't be humble. <laughs> um, you know, that's funny because I was, um, I kept everything under wraps. But you know what? After that second one, I wish I would have shot magic arrows or something. I don't know. But uh, those were fun. When I watched the replay of both those events, there's two things I think of the most outside of what you did. Uh, one was Tony actually smiling and clapping. And the other one was Chris Duncan going crazy in the background in the dugout, which you've seen a million times. Yep. Let's go back to Tony. What did he say to you when, if you can remember, when you got to the dugout and had a chance to, you know, high five, handshake, whatever, pat on the back? What did he say? Um, nobody really said anything in the dugout. Um, just beyond high five, and that was amazing, and this and that. Now, after the game, um, when you go back to the first throw, because Willie Tavares was on second, I'm not sure who was on first, there was one out. So it was fly ball to center, I should have thrown Quintanilla. the ball to second. Was he on first? I think so. Okay. So the ball should have went to second. Um, just to keep the double play in order, um, and all that. Anyway, um, I was walking into the hotel, and Tony was with a group of his friends eating dinner, and um, uh, John Elway's. And um, he was like, hey, that was a great throw, but don't ever F and do it again. So, <laughs> <laughs> But it was one of those comments where I don't think he was, it was like a semi-joke, but yeah. not really. Yeah. Yeah. You had the point across <laughs> yeah, like he, he normally does. Yep. Um, with everything you've been through, ups and downs and, you know, I'm sure so many sleepless nights and the wonderment of it. Do you love the game of baseball? Do you still have the appreciation and love it as when you were a kid and enjoyed it? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting watching the game now. And really when I watch it, and I was thinking this last night, I was sitting in the booth with you. It, it, that se the playing days seem like a different time. I watch like how fast these guys are and the, just what they're able to do right now. And it doesn't seem like I was ever able to do that. It's strange. But you were. I, I know. You I'm were with that you. guy. I'm with you. It's, it's neat. It, it's, fun to be, it's fun to be around it. Um, and my kids are getting to that age now too, so it's you know it's a lot of fun. So you're not bitter about the game at all? No, I was at first when when I first retired, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go out maybe not the way you want, and you're not sure if you like it. Um, I didn't want to watch it. It took it took about six months, um, but now full swing back into it. Love it. Do your kids know your story? They do. Um, I'm not sure if they grasp it all. But they definitely, they definitely know, and they're definitely getting old enough now to, you know, like start to really understand. So, um, yeah, I think they get it. They get more from their friends and their friends' dads, I feel like, than, than me at home. But you know how that goes. And, and knowing how you grew up a little bit and reading your book, and we've talked, uh, you know, off camera and stuff, it, it's got to make you, uh, being a dad, appreciate how to be, is, is, none of us are perfect, but trying to be the right dad. Yeah. And I bet that's the way that you, I've seen you with your kids. You're awesome with your kids. And that, that probably helps you in what you're trying to do now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just try to, to give them all the things that I felt like I missed out on. Um, but I think every parent does that, right? It's, it's no different. I, I feel like you, you know, you want what's best for your child. And there's always that, that balance of, um, are you raising them right? Are you spoiling them? Are you doing the right thing? I think that's always going to be a constant question. But you know, I, we all do the best we can. So, coaching? Do you do you think about doing that? Do you want to do that? What at what level? You tell me. Um, I enjoy coaching the kids and helping out, um, especially right where they're getting right now, and they're starting to get to that age where we can really start to get into some things um, that can help them be better players. Um, I don't know about the professional level. I mean, I think I like helping from the outside. Um, but especially with my kids being eight and ten, I don't. I wouldn't want to be in uniform because I want to be able to see them grow up. Absolutely. What are you most proud of when you reflect on your professional baseball career? There's a lot of things you can be proud of. I mean, as a high school kid, you're the number one kid in high school. Everybody knew who you. Your name was commonplace among baseball people when you were a little guy. Um, the unbelievable story with Major League Baseball. So, what are you most proud of? Uh, I, I think a lot of it, really. Um, making it the first time, um, giving it everything I had to come back and make it the second time. Um, I'm proud of all those things and I'm proud of never giving up. And that's what's up. I showed up every day, I gave the best I could. And I think, you know, as a professional, um, you know, I can look in the mirror and say, I gave it everything I had. Best moment, which one was it? Throws, home run? 
Uh, Pitching? What What do you got? Um, there's a bunch of them in there, and, and I like them for different reasons. But the throws were amazing. The home run back was incredible. You couldn't write a better script. Um, you know, coming back and hitting a home run with the Braves, that was incredible. I uh, grew up a Braves fan. Just There's moments in there where, where at the time, um, you know, it was the greatest thing that ever happened. And it's, it's hard to put one against the other. And my final question, what is your message to kids? Yeah, you are an inspiration for so many people, whether you're in sports or any walk of life. What's your standard inspiration when you talk to those people? Remember it's a game and have fun with it. Um, I was a perfectionist for a long time and I, and I think it got me far, but I think it can get you in trouble too. Um, but to remember to have fun with it, right? It's supposed to be a game, have fun, work hard, show up, do your thing, but have fun with the game. It's an incredible story from a truly remarkable athlete and person, and that's Ricky and Keel. You can find Rick's book, The Phenomenon, wherever books are sold. Thanks to Ricky and Keel, a great story of the human spirit.